the air cooling thermal results are in on the Cooler Master NR200. Today I'll share my observations, the thermal data, and give my recommendation for optimal fan layouts in this case. All I can say is, things are looking pretty interesting. Hey everyone, thanks for checking in. I've been doing a series on the Cooler Master NR200, so feel free to check in on the other videos if you haven't done so already. I've done an initial build and first impressions, as well as a follow-up on the drive support, mounting solutions, and the accessories. Cooler Master provides a myriad of locations and options for fan mounting. In theory, you could install seven case fans in total. Now, that's well past the point of diminishing returns. A question you might have is, should I fill all those spots? And how do I orient the cooler fans? And where's that point of diminishing returns? So today I'm gonna to discuss the fan orientation for the case fans within the context of air CPU cooling. Now the retail version of the case ships with two fans. There's a 120 millimeter fan and a 92 millimeter fan. Since I'm using the Noctua U12A, which is a push-pull arrangement out of the box, in my initial build, I had to remove the 92mm fan in order to fit the cooler. The 92mm fan was too thick and it was bumping up against the cooler fans. And you might recall that my intuition at first was to exhaust out the back, and in order to feed the CPU cooler with fresh air, I directed the top case fan downwards with the assumption that the arrangement would yield the best thermals. Um, and I flipped the fan out of its out-of-the-box configuration. As you'll see, after my extensive testing, that's actually not the best way to do it, although it's not necessarily the worst. I was thinking too much in terms of cases that have a tempered glass panel or poor ventilation. Now, this one's the NR200 version, which doesn't come with a tempered glass panel. So first, a quick blurb on my testing methodology. Now, I realize that there's no one way that works for everyone's use case, so I wanted to note a few things. First, this isn't a CPU, GPU, or even a fan test. I'm looking at this case with the specific intention of optimizing fan layout. So my express goal was to generate a fixed and consistent thermal load. The only way to do that is with a repeatable CPU-based task that would complete in roughly the same amount of time across all testing. Here, the input variable is fan layout, with the output being different thermals and different noise levels. In addition, if you've ever worked with auto overclocking or PBO on Ryzen, you'll know that the CPU clocks are all over the place, meaning it's working at a different rate based on its perceived thermal headroom. In other words, that means that allowing the CPU to boost itself in both its stock behavior or auto overclock behavior would lead to different speeds at which the task is completed. While this might be useful in gaming or other everyday tasks, the thermal data that we would collect from that scenario wouldn't be very useful, uh, since from test to test, the CPU might be doing work at different rates. So, for all testing, CPU clock speeds were locked for all cores at both stock clocks and overclock frequencies. I ran Blender 2.82, rendering the classroom scene, since it's a scene that typically takes around 10 minutes or so to render at the stock clocks and that gives enough time for the heatsink to hit thermal equilibrium. Air coolers tend to hit thermal equilibrium a lot quicker than water-based coolers, so there's not a huge amount of time required uh, to hit thermal equilibrium. Uh, they also shed heat very quickly, but I gave a minimum of five minutes in between tests for the system to flush out any air and didn't proceed to test until the CPU was backed at the expected idle temperatures. Now, uh, I'll note this was never an issue as five minutes was always more than enough for the system to settle back down uh, to, to the idle temperatures. Now, hardware parameters were monitored and they were logged with an open hardware monitor. I collected the thermals from the final five minutes of each render. At a data point each second, this equated to 300 data points, which were then averaged out. Now I did that to eliminate any random spikes that might occur. So taking the max temp would have been misleading, especially when, as you'll see, results are fairly close. All testing was done with my Ryzen 3700X on a Gigabyte X570 Aorus ITX motherboard, which I have a pretty good idea of what it can be reliably clocked to. And noise was measured with a decibel meter at a fixed 20 centimeters away from the left side case panel. 
and ambient temps were measured 40 centimeters away, with the probe outside the direct area of the case, so that the exhaust air wouldn't have an inordinate impact on the ambient temp measurements. I first tested out just one case fan, since I realized that many of you will want to avoid having to buy another case fan if you can. Uh, to be fair, uh, fans can be a pricey investment, but that also gives us a baseline to see if it's really worth it uh, to invest in another fan. Then two fans were tested. Um, I used a Noctua NFF12 I had lying around since I personally think it's overkill and a bad idea from a value perspective to use something like a Noctua NFA12 as a case fan, especially when the case is well ventilated. Um, the NFF12 also has a noise and CFM curve that's more approximate to other typical case fans on the market. And it's a $20 fan, which will be easier to stomach for some people. So I tested the one fan and two fan snares in both intake and exhaust at the top for the stock clocks. I then also tested the fans at the bottom and well, I'll let the data do the talking. And once I got into overclocking, it quickly became apparent that the top intake orientation was suboptimal. So I stopped testing that also. Let's get into the data. First off, the 3700X at an all-core fixed clock of 3.6 GHz performed pretty similarly across all the single fan scenarios, arguably within measurement error. Uh, the render times were surprisingly consistent at 10 minutes, give or take a few seconds. In terms of noise levels, we're also looking at around the same noise performance, which makes sense because the thermals are so close, and we have the same number of case and cooler fans. The real source of the noise when I analyzed the data was from the two NFA12 CPU fans. Um, the case fans were almost always running at around 1200 RPM. Surprisingly, when I took off all of the case fans, no case fans at the top, the stock clocks were totally manageable. And with the U12A as an intake, thermals came in within margin of error, but for no apparent gain in noise performance. So likely the CPU cooler fans were working harder to compensate. At least based on this test, it looks like the CPU cooler fans is an exhaust, and exhausting air out of the top with the case fans is the optimal configuration, at least in terms of thermals and noise. And here are the results with the top case fan in an intake position. I did do a few tests with dual fans as intakes, and it was immediately evident that the case fans perform best in the exhaust position. Not that these are poor thermals, in fact, they're pretty fantastic still. But because I came to that realization early on, I stopped testing the fans in an intake position. From this point on, I stopped presenting the case fans as an intake because, irrespective of cooler orientation, they simply underperformed. So just how bad was using the case fan as a bottom intake? Well, uh, well the CPU temps were about three degrees worse and uh, with similar noise levels. So there really wasn't any point uh, testing the case fans as a bottom intake anymore. Um, you really want to run them at the top. Now, when I did my initial layout, I was thinking in terms of a solid tempered glass panel. I neglected the fact that the cooler fans could just as easily take in air from the mesh side panels. As it turns out, the reason I think the top exhaust is effective here, regardless of cooler orientation, is that when the cooler is in intake mode from the back, the case fan can exhaust the hot air out the top quickly. And when the cooler is in exhaust mode, the case fans help draw in that cool air through the side panel and into the path of the CPU cooler so it can intake all that cool air. So, at more average thermal loads, there's really not a huge difference between CPU cooler as intake or exhaust. Uh, for the dual fan scenario, we see that thermals aren't that much better, even though they are, but the cooler as an exhaust is still the best configuration, with a similar noise profile to a single fan uh, in exhaust position. Now getting into the overclocked results, things start shaking out a little bit more visibly here. This particular 3700X runs at an all-core overclock of 4.3 GHz at just 1.25 volts. A little bit of luck in the silicon lottery, but all the same, we can still get a big thermal load from overclocking. And here the render is all completed in around 8 minutes and 30 seconds. So we're really starting to push the thermal limits of both the CPU cooler and the case fans. So things are a little bit more telling. We can see here for the single fan, the exhaust 
exhaust position is still best with the lowest thermals and a tie for lowest noise. Now surprisingly, the fan exhausting in this left position uh, presents the best thermals. Although I have to say, these are all remarkably close. Next up, dual fans. Similar results. The cooler fans in an exhaust position are best. And they're also quietest when compared to the cooler as an intake. So if we compare all the best overclock configurations between the dual case fans and the single case fan scenarios, we see that a single case fan isn't too bad when compared to dual case fans. Uh, certainly the noise levels and thermals are well within sample variation. So I threw in another scenario here uh, while utilizing the similar equipment. I mentioned in my initial first impressions review that this would be an interesting scenario to test. So what I did was I took off uh, one of the NFA-12s from the cooler and I threw it into the top as a case fan. And then I put the 92 millimeter fan that wouldn't fit originally on the back as an intake. And using the remaining cooler fan to pull air sent into the heatsink from the 92 millimeter fan, it yielded a both a lower noise level at a slightly higher thermal level, so, but not noticeably so. So it's actually a very interesting scenario and pretty applicable for those of you running single fan coolers. All right, well, it's looking pretty good for the CPU cooler as an exhaust with one or two case fans exhausting, right? So gaming is actually pretty difficult to max out thermals consistently. So what I didn't want to do was use that as a proxy. And also rarely are people limited uh, by the CPU in games. So a scenario where we max out the GPU and max out the CPU simultaneously would be a bit unrealistic. But we still need to know what impact the C GPU running would have on the CPU thermals, right? So knowing what to test for in a final showdown, I could totally hone in so we can get an official recommendation. For the final test, I didn't use any single fan configs. I only wanted to test the optimal scenario since this test is really challenging. What I did was I ran Unigen Heaven 4.0 for 10 minutes, letting that 1660 Super warm up. And it's already overclocked out of the box, right? Uh, and then while keeping this uh, Unigen running, I started the same Blender render. And I did this test at 4.3 gigahertz, just like all the other overclocked tests. And interestingly, only the cooler in an exhaust position managed to finish. All the others uh, managed to crash the system at that overclock, meaning that it was not thermally sufficient. So to get some useful data, I clocked down to 4.2 gigahertz at 1.2 volts. Um, see, here we see that the exhaust uh, configuration has equal thermals and noise level, but the differentiator here is that it's got significantly different GPU thermals, and it makes sense, right? The cooler, when it's in exhaust mode, is pushing the hot CPU air outside the case as soon as possible. So this GPU wouldn't be running in a cloud of hotter air pushed out of the CPU heatsink. And even though it's theoretically possible for the GPU air to be sucked into the CPU heatsink uh, when it's in the exhaust position, guess what happens to the heatsink uh, when it's intaking from the outside? It's pulling all that exhausted GPU air back, right back into the case. So that's probably why the CPU thermals are dead on even in this comparison. Now for a thought exercise, I threw an additional two NFA-12s into the case. Uh, keeping in mind, these are total overkill as case fans and they're dead quiet. Now here's a surprising result since I would have thought that more is better when it comes to case fans, right? Yep, the GPU thermals do appear to be a little bit better when those two fans are mounted at the bottom but the noise levels from the four case fans are slightly higher and surprisingly, so are the CPU thermals. And after thinking about it, it makes total sense. The case fans at the bottom would push a lot more of this hot GPU air back into the path of the CPU tower, making it run a lot hotter. So after all that, what's my final recommendation? Now keep in mind, these are all mind-blowingly amazing thermals for a small form factor case. I totally underestimated the power of the mesh panel and how well ventilated the case was in my initial assumptions. At least from the data, even if you totally screwed up the orientations, you'd still get perfectly acceptable temps. That being said, you wouldn't have watched this far if you didn't care for the absolute best thermal arrangement, right? So I went a long way to come to a pretty simple conclusion. 
It's really elegant. Run one or two case fans at the top as an exhaust. And although there's minimal difference for the CPU uh, thermals itself, for the sake of GPU thermals, uh, run that CPU fan as an exhaust. And let's not forget, there's no dust filter at the back, so it's not as good to pull that air in. Um, lastly, I wouldn't rush out and buy a second top case fan if you don't already have one. Uh, the one or two degree difference um, really doesn't warrant it. Uh, the data shows that mounting, on the left or right isn't a huge difference either. So put it wherever you can, since a wider tower cooler could potentially prevent you from mounting a fan on the left side. So you might mount it in the, on the right side in that case. As a thought exercise, I took all the fans off the cooler and ran the two as an exhaust at the top. Then I plugged the 92 millimeter fan back in as an intake. Um, if you never go above stock clocks, this is actually a perfectly viable configuration. The test render finished at around the same time, and with the thermals uh, for the stock clocks at 3600 megahertz, it came in about 13 degrees higher than all the other results, or about 41 degrees above ambient, which is actually totally manageable for Ryzen. Uh, it was a full two decibels quieter, but at the expense of higher thermals. So we can see here that uh, Cooler Master's shipped configuration is more or less indicative of their suggested layout. They shipped the 92 millimeter case fan uh, installed in the case as an exhaust, while the grill and toolless fan mounting hardware for the 120 millimeter case fan was pre-mounted uh, for that case fan in an exhaust position. So at least now I know why. And I also know just how much time toolless fan mounting saves when you're mounting and flipping and remounting the top case fans was seen to be a gazillion times. Anyway, I know that was a lot of numbers and a lot of data, but I hope you enjoyed the analysis. Uh, next up is AIO cooling, and I'll be testing this guy out. So stay tuned, stay safe, and peace out.